Good morning. Welcome to Colfax Center Church. It's a great morning to be with you. The sun is shining. The weather's cooling off. I love this time of year. A um, couple of announcements before we get started. First, uh, their newsletters are on the back table. Uh, they've also been sent out to you in an email, so be sure to pick those up. And there's lots of good things in there to know what's going on here at the church. Uh, secondly, there will be no Sunday school next week for, um, to recognize Labor Day. So make sure you uh, note that. Also, during Coffee Fellowship today, we, are, we have two special celebrations. One is with Claire Belson and David Barnes celebrating their engagement and soon their wedding. So we want to uh, have a lot of fun celebrating them. And uh, Ori Neverline's 90th birthday during the, um, during the Coffee Fellowship. So please join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the care team's put together a lot of great stuff for that and musical number and everything. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, one announcement about Sunday school. We just want to make sure that parents of elementary age kids um, be sure to, to escort your kids to and from their Sunday school classes and be present there. Um, the teachers, they're under their teacher's care. And so those teachers don't want to just release them from, uh, from the, the rooms without knowing that they're going directly to either a parent or a guardian. So please be there for before and after presently at the pickup time, okay? Uh, and that goes for me, too, because I've done the exact same thing, so I get it. Um, and then finally, um, we want to pray for um, Kurt Chepkis, who uh, went to the hospital this morning. Heart was out of rhythm, and we don't want to just pray for him, that the doctors can care for him. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us before we hear our call to worship, okay? Heavenly Father, as we come before you to worship you, to celebrate the goodness uh, that you bring into our lives, to uh, come before you and confess of our sin and our brokenness uh, and ask for your forgiveness and ask for uh, your healing and your work, at, uh, to, your hand to be at work in our lives. Lord, we pray for our brother Kurt, uh, who is currently being cared for by doctors and nurses. Would you give them the wisdom uh, and the, uh, the resources necessary to care for him? And um, would you just be with him? Would you comfort him? Uh, be with Julie as she cares for him. And uh, Lord, would you provide abundantly? Um, we know that you are good. We know that your steadfast love endures forever. And pray that you would be at work, uh, as you always are, uh, in our congregation. Uh, in our families, uh, in our community. We pray for you to be at work this morning. Uh, we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand. Let's hear our call to worship this morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 16. The psalmist writes, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Let's sing together our first song, Speak, O Lord.
Amen. You may be seated. Our call to confession this morning comes from Romans chapter 1. The Apostle Paul writes, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and their heart uh, and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Let's pray together our prayer of adoration and confession this morning as we come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, as we pray that you would speak to us, that you would be at work in our hearts, that you would transform us and transform our lives, we are reminded of how easily we go astray. We're reminded of who we were before we knew you and who we continue to be when we do not attach ourselves to you because we still succumb to our sin nature, to the, the parts of us that still long for this world, that still long for the things of this world, that would worship the things of this world rather than seeing them as things that have been created by you and an opportunity to worship you. Lord, we exchange the glory of God for the glory that is made in this world because you made it, because you imprinted yourself on it, because it's so glorious and amazing. All we have to do is go outside and see a sunset to, to begin to worship the things of this creation. All we have to do is look at the changing of the seasons and begin to be drawn to worship the creation rather than being drawn to worship the one who made it. So Lord, would you forgive us would you strengthen us? Would you purify us? Because when we begin to worship the creature, when we begin to worship the things that you've made, it changes our hearts. It changes our longings. We begin to long for this world. We begin to have a taste for this world, a palate for this world, and we do not have a taste for you. Lord, we desensitize ourselves. We, we become addicted to this world rather than longing for and needing more of you. And Would you forgive us, Lord? Would you cleanse us? Would you allow us to be drawn more and more into your presence? Would you allow us to be more and more desiring of you, of your holiness, of your goodness, that we would worship you in all things? I pray this in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. From Romans chapter 1, again, just prior to that passage, Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Amen. That is our good news this morning. Let's stand and respond in celebration and praise. Singing number 42, All Hail the Power.
Amen. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, as we come before you to give of our tithes and our offerings, would we offer our entire lives to you? Lord, would we offer a spiritual and physical sacrifice to you? Everything belongs to you, so would you be glorified in this? Would we give to the church, to the work of your church in this community, so that we would be a blessing to those in our church and those outside of our church, those who need to hear the words and the truth of the gospel? Would you be at work in our hearts today? Would we give generously and give joyfully? Would you bless this time? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you, Sandy. Would you please stand? Let's sing our doxology together. There's so many amazing ways we get to worship our God through song, through hearing his word, through singing praises, through prayer, and through confessing our faith together. Let's confess our faith together using the New City Catechism number 43. I'll read the question, then we'll respond together. What are the sacraments or ordinances? The sacraments or ordinances given by God and instituted by Christ namely baptism and the lord's supper are visible signs and seals that we are bound together as a community of faith by his death and resurrection by our use of them the holy spirit more fully declares and seals the promises of the gospel to us amen you may be seated Let's pray together our prayer of thanksgiving and supplication this morning. Lord Jesus, we can't hear that song without the words coming to mind that we will cherish that old rugged cross, that we will always cherish what you have done for your people. And so we give you thanks this morning, Lord Jesus. We give you thanks that you made it possible, that you did all of the work on our behalf, that you gave everything up so that we could take your seat at your Father's right hand. We so do not deserve it. We deserve the exact opposite. We deserve eternal punishment. We deserve eternal separation from you because we have defied you. We have worked outside of our design and we have longed for things of this world rather than longing for you. We have defied the one true king of all the universe. So Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for going before us and making it possible for us to be forgiven, to come before you and worship you, to know that when we sing songs to you and we, we pray prayers to you, that your Father hears them because of the work that you have done, because you continue to intercede for us. And we pray that you would continue to intercede for us and that your Holy Spirit would be at work in us and in our community. Lord, I can't help but think about those who are right now in Louisiana and the South Coast who have a hurricane bearing down on them with winds blowing at 150 miles an hour. Lord, their lives are at risk. They are right now in this moment physically in need of you, of your protection. Would you be with them? Would you keep them safe? Would you allow first responders to get to them and to help them? And Lord, we pray that so many would have been able to to evacuate in time. But Lord, we pray that you, for safety, for you to limit the damage, for your mighty hand to be at work to hold back this storm. And yet, Lord, this storm has come upon the southern coast, and so would you be with them? Would you give them the strength, especially those who belong to you? Would you give them the strength to rely upon you and the faith to look to you for their sustaining energy, for their sustaining faith, even in the midst of the storm? And Lord, we pray that you would be at work in our, in our hearts and in our community and in the storms that we experience and the trials that we go through. Lord, it's so easy to seek for temporary relief from whatever we're facing, to seek for something to fix our circumstances, for us to just be invested right here and right now and only be thinking about the present, only be thinking about the next few years, only be thinking about the physical and the material, about the desires of our flesh, about the desires of just experiencing the goodness of this earth. And yet, we so easily sacrifice the spiritual things. We so easily sacrifice our relationship with you, the nourishment of our souls, the growth, the development of our faith in you and our love for you, even to the point where we would get to heaven and not know what to do because we hadn't been spending our time doing the very thing that we will do for eternity, which is live in light of you 
which is worship you and praise you and, and bask in your presence, enjoy your goodness and enjoy your blessings. Lord, all, would all that we do be an opportunity to worship you? And would all that we do turn our hearts towards you? Would you open our hearts as we look at your word this morning, as we consider the story of Esau and Jacob? We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. And that cricket is going to drive me crazy, but I'm going to try to ignore it. I think it, I, I, I don't know what that thorn in Paul's side was. No one really does. But sometimes I wonder if it was something as simple as, as something following him around, driving him crazy, and keeping him from being able to, to preach and to do God's word. But we're going we're gonna to give thanks for God's goodness and his creation in nature. Uh, if you want to open up and follow along in your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 25. And we're going to be looking at the story of Jacob and Esau. If you're new or visiting, we've been, we've been going through the book of Genesis, and we've been seeing this, this process of God calling out a people and, and calling out this specific family of Abraham. And what we're going to see now is Abraham had a son, Isaac, and Isaac now has sons, Jacob and Esau. And this story, we're going to look at the, their, their struggle in the womb, and we're going to look at this story of Esau and Jacob and Esau selling his birthright giving up his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. And that it says, at the very, very end of the passage, it says that Esau despised his birthright. And so what we're going to focus on is the problem of love for the world and desire for instant gratification. The problems of love for the world and desire for instant gratification, what we're willing to sacrifice to benefit us right now, or just in the present, or just in the next few years, and the dangers of not developing a longer view of our lives and developing a taste for the Lord. We're so good at developing a taste for this world and the things of this world, and yet if we don't develop a taste for for the Lord and the spiritual things that God promises us, we put everything at risk that we would even sacrifice our spiritual well-being for the sake of material good and desires. So what we're going to see as we walk through this passage is first, what does it mean that, that Esau and Jacob are part of the chosen family? What, who is Esau? Secondly, then, what does it mean that he despised his birthright? What does it mean to despise your birthright? And what, what was everything that he was willing to give up? And what are even the spiritual sacrifices he was making? And how do we make those same sacrifices in our own lives? And then finally, if you're following along in your bulletin, we're going to look at the birthright of the gospel. How does the gospel fill up what Esau gives up? How does the gospel make it possible for us to follow after God and to lay hold of those spiritual benefits that God promises to give us? That's what we're going to look at this morning, okay? Let's read our passage together. Genesis 25, verses 19 through 34. This is God's word. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. 
Thus, Esau despised his birthright. This is God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you be with us as we consider your word? Help us to see the ways in which we put our own spiritual well-being at risk simply for temporary material gain. Would you reveal our sin to us? Would you reveal your goodness and your gospel to us? And would you write it on our hearts and transform us today? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, who you're related to matters. Depending on the context, who you're related to matters. In, in politics, it used to matter if someone was related to a Kennedy or related to a Bush. Even here in a small town, it matters who you're related to. When you, when you tell people, I'm related to this family or fa- that family, there's assumptions that come with that. If people know the history of that family, then they'll, they'll assume things about you. They'll think certain things about your family or where you come from, what kind of life you live or what kind of industry you come from. And the same thing was true here at the time, and yet what it meant to be part of a chosen family was far greater than anything we really understand or anything we experience. What does it mean for Esau to be in the family line of Abraham? If you look back at the passage, in the very beginning, these, um, it says in verse 19, these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. That phrase, these are the generations, is used to begin a new section of the book of Genesis. It's used with Noah, it's used with Abraham, it's used with Isaac, and it's going to be used for all the patriarchs. It's to tell us we're in a new section, now we're focusing on Isaac and his kids. And what we're, what we're reminded, the way it phrases it, is we're reminded, remember who Isaac is. Isaac is Abraham's son. Isaac received the promise that was given to Abraham. It's Isaac's family that's going to carry out this blessing to all of the world, that God's going to use Isaac's family now to be the family of promise. And secondly, Esau is the firstborn son. As the firstborn son in that community, Esau would have had the primary spot in the family, in Isaac's family. Esau would have been the favorite because the, the, the family, the culture at the time, held the firstborn son in high esteem. And we see that, in, we see the evidence of that in verse 27. It says, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the hill, or excuse me, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac, his father, loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Isaac, his father, loved Esau because he ate of his game. They had this relationship. Not only would Isaac have a natural love and affinity for his son, his firstborn son, which would be his firstborn heir, but he loved him because he brought him food. I, Esau was, was encouraged. Every time Esau was, was given love because, hey, you brought me food again. You brought me venison. You brought me another deer. I love you. I love you for, for providing for me. And in, his, in Isaac's old age, he wouldn't be able to hunt for himself. And so they developed this clear, loving relationship with one another. Esau was the firstborn son. He was loved by his father. And he had the primary spot in this chosen family that God had called out. And this is the first circumstance of them ever fighting with one another. The first story that we have of Jacob and Esau fighting with one another since they came out of the womb. We'll talk about them fighting in the womb in a second, but we read in verse 29, once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some, uh, some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. And that phrase, actually, we, it's cleaned up in the English, but what, it really, what, what he really says is, hey, give me some of that red stuff, that red stuff that you're making right there. I'm exhausted. Give me some of that food. Right? He's so exhausted, he just says, hey, give me some of that. Therefore, his name was called Edom, which means red. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. What use is the birthright to me? Jacob says, swear to me now. And he swore to him and gave him his birthright. I could almost guarantee that these boys are teenagers, right? Able to fight in the field, able to cook. Have you ever heard teenagers try to negotiate doing chores? Try to tell one another, hey, you know, hey, you have to do the dishes. No, it's not my day. It's your day. I did it this morning, it's my turn to sit there, it's my turn to do that, it's your turn to do that. And then they'll try to negotiate, like, well, if you do the dishes today, I'll do them for the next four days. If you do the laundry today, I'll do it for the next week. Right? They try to negotiate with each other, they try to negotiate with their parents, and you can just hear it in their back and forth. Esau came in, he was exhausted, Jacob was cooking stew, and he says, hey, let me have some of that stuff you're making. And Jacob says, 
give me your birthright. What, I don't, what good is a birthright to me? I'm going to die, right? He's, he's so, right, teenagers are also, tend to be, just like all of us, but tend to be a little dramatic, right? Oh, I'm, but I'm going to die. I'm, so, I'm starving. I, I can't. They're trying to, he's trying to work out his problems, and he'll do anything just to not have to make himself food. It took a lot longer to make yourself food. You can't just throw a burrito in the microwave, right? There was work involved, and yet Esau wasn't willing to do it. He had gotten to a point where he had received so much love from his dad, so much encouragement, so much, so much uh, a relationship with him that he became entitled. He'd do anything to relieve his pain, even if it meant greater consequences down the road. Anything to avoid having to go through the struggle and the problem of making myself a meal. Let me just have that. I'll give you anything. He was only thinking about the here and now and not thinking about the consequences down the road. When Amy and I were, when I was going to seminary, we, I think Kayla was born at this point, but my car, um, car broke down, we needed a new car, and we didn't have a lot of money at the time, and so we scraped together $2,000 and bought ourselves a used Honda Civic. And it was old, and it was junky, and a teenager owned it beforehand, and I scrubbed the thing clean with bleach wipes. But um, it was, you know, it got me from A to B. It got me from our house to school and back. The problem with it from the very beginning is that it had an oil leak. And so I knew, okay, either I can spend hundreds of dollars to fix this oil leak, or I just check the oil, and once in a while I have to put a cord in. It seems much more desirable to just spend five bucks every once in a while than to spend hundreds of dollars to fix an oil leak. It just showed how little I knew about engines. Because what happens when you let a car run out of oil is the engine begins to seize up because oil is meant to be a lubricant. It lets those pistons run up and down. So one day, and all of you who know engines are just realizing how foolish I am, at least, this, hey, this was 10 years ago, so this, I mean, at least I get the credit that I've learned something since then, right? I was driving down the road, I had just left our house, and all of a sudden, I didn't realize it, the alarms didn't go off, but it ran out of oil, it seized up, and the, pist the piston rod that lets those pistons run up and down shot straight through the engine block. I totaled the car. It was worth, I was able to push it to the mechanic that was right down the street, and he gave me $200 to scrap it, right? Probably more than what it would have cost just to, fix the just to fix the oil leak. What's the cost of avoiding a problem right now and kicking it down the road thinking, this is just what's convenient for now, so this is what I'll do? We end up in a position to experience a lot more suffering down the road. And the same is true in our relationship with God. The same is true as we as Christians seek to avoid our problems and find relief for right now. We just need to get through right now. And yet we're even willing to put spiritual benefits and spiritual inheritance at risk just to have what we want right now. Let's look at what that means. Esau in his foolishness was willing to, what was Esau in his foolishness willing to sacrifice? If you're following along this, point number two, what does it mean for him to despise his birthright, like it says in verse 34? What was Esau willing to give up just to have what he wanted right now? Well, we already know he was the firstborn. He not, so he had the pr most prominent spot in his family. But what we, don't, what we have to realize is in that culture, the firstborn wasn't just the most loved or was going to be the head of the family, but he actually stood to inherit a double portion of his father's inheritance. So he would have twice as much of the inheritance as any other child in the family. He would get twice as much of, uh, of the inheritance than Jacob would. Gordon Wenham in his commentary talks about this. He says, The first son in the family was held in special esteem in Israel. He was regarded as the first fruits of his father's strength. That's why Isaac loved him. He was dedicated to God. We read that in Exodus. He was in turn specially privileged during his lifetime. And when the inheritance was divided up, Deuteronomy 21 tells us, the firstborn shall receive a double share that is twice as much as any other brother of his father's property. So what Esau was willing to give up, what he wasn't even thinking about, or maybe he, he was thinking about it, but he was willing to give it up in that moment, was twice as much, his whole inheritance from his father, 
But it went further than that even. We read uh, one, a different commentary that is German commentators. They say, uh, the birthright consisted afterwards of a couple things. First, as we read, a double portion of the father's inheritance. But with the patriarchs, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it had more to do, it, it, there was more to it than that. It embraced the chieftainship, the rule over the brethren of the entire family. So Esau is the firstborn son. After his father Isaac died, he would be in charge of the entire tribe of Abraham's family. It also included the title to the blessing of the promise, which included both the future possession of the land of Canaan and the covenant fellowship with God. He was giving up his inheritance, giving up his position as the chief over the tribe, giving up this future blessing from God to inherit the land down the road that his family would inherit the land of Canaan, and he was giving up his very relationship with God. This prominent position to be the one that God would speak to, that would be the head of the family, the mediator between God and his people. They go on, they say, because the birthright blessings were primarily spiritual in nature, Esau put no value in them. The only thing of value to him was the sensual enjoyment of the present. The spiritual blessings of the future, his mind was unable to estimate. In this, he showed himself to be a profane man, we read in Hebrews chapter 12. He was a profane man who cared for nothing but the momentary gratification of sensual desires. Esau was willing to give up everything, everything, just to get a bowl of stew because he was only focused on the here and now. He was only focused on the physical and didn't consider spiritual blessings down the road, blessings for his family and his, his children after him of any value because they wouldn't benefit him right here and right now. Donald Guthrie writes, the foolishness of Esau in exchanging his privilege as the eldest son for a single meal is so glaring that he has become a type of all who put material or sensual advantages before their spiritual heritage. Esau was regarded as one of the most striking examples of those who fail to appropriate God's grace. Esau knew exactly what he was giving up, and yet he didn't value God's blessings. He didn't value the relationship that he could have with God because he didn't have a desire for God. He didn't have a taste for God. He didn't have a palate for God. He had a desire and a taste and a palate for the things of this world. He had a desire and a taste and a palate for the right here, right now, the sensual, material, physical benefits of what he could receive here and now simply by getting a bowl of stew. When Amy and I got, uh, we got COVID back in November. We got it over, over the, uh, the Thanksgiving season. And we both, one of the symptoms that came along with COVID that we both got was loss of our sense of smell and taste. Amy still has partial loss of her smell, sense of smell, um, which sometimes benefits me, sometimes doesn't. But we lost our sense of taste. So our, our, our bodies are crazy. They're amazing the ways that, they're, that they are designed. We, I don't know if you know this, and we were talk, I was talking to my son about this, Caleb. Your taste buds themselves, you have a bunch of different kinds of taste buds. Your taste buds replicate. They die and reproduce themselves about every two weeks. That's why when you burn your tongue, it doesn't stay there for forever like a scar on your skin. Your tongue replicates all of its taste buds about every two weeks. And the unique thing about your, about your tongue and your sense of taste is that it can become desensitized to certain tastes. You can become desensitized to spices. You can become desensitized to, to salts. You can become especially desensitized to sugars. When we take in processed sugars, especially basic sugar or corn syrup, we can desensitize our sense of taste to the point where things that are naturally sweet, like fruit or vegetables, are no longer sweet because we've desensitized our sense of taste 
that we need a bigger rush, we need a bigger sweetness so that we could taste that same flavor. And yet the problem is that simple sugar, those simple carbohydrates, those things that we take in that taste so good in that moment, they give us this rush of dopamine in our brains. They give us this rush, this high. We love a sugar high. You can see it when kids get donuts or they get cookies. They go running all over the place. We do the same thing. We just kind of, we sometimes try to contain it. And yet what happens is there inevitably, you come down off of that high, that dopamine, and you crash and you experience depression or sadness or just tiredness. And when that happens over a long period of time, you can experience actual depression and actual physical responses simply to a desensitization of that sense of sweetness, that sense of taste that can lead us, just a, te a temporary high that can eventually lead us down a road of depression and thing, all kinds of problems down the road. The Wall Street Journal just talked about something similar. They said um, in a recent article, they talked about how the increase in the rates of depression and anxiety in a wealthy country like the United States correlate with an increase in the technology that, that our American brains are hooked on. That when we get on our technology, when we get on texting or social media or online shopping, we get a rush of dopamine right there in that moment. And yet, when we can't have it constantly, we end up experiencing depression and anxiety. When we do it over a long period of time, we desensitize ourselves to just those things in this world that were meant to be pleasurable. We have no palate for the simple things because we have overexerted, we've we have over and desensitized our sense of taste. And the same thing can happen with our palate for God. When we feast on the things of this world, when we see the glory of the things in this world and we begin to worship those things, we begin to put all of our energy and all of our effort and all of our time into those things rather than seeing those things as an opportunity to worship God. We begin to get addicted to the things of this world rather than getting addicted to God and his glory. Rather than being drawn toward him, having a taste for him, We've trained our brains to love the world. And so like Esau, we have to ask the question, how are we putting temporary pleasures and success above our spiritual heritage? How are we not seeing the long-term effects of the things we're doing right now that can end up having a terrible impact down the road? We can see this in a simple sense relationally. There's story after story of, of families where the parents have worked so hard and they've, they've provided, they've, they've provided financially for their family. Their kids, don't, their kids have everything they could possibly need. They're not lacking in anything. And yet, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, those parents don't have a relationship with those kids because they didn't invest. They didn't spend time with them, quality time to invest in that relationship. We see this even now with families, and whether, whether the kids are involved in sports or academics or scholarships or have to pursue success so they, can, so they can go to a good college so that they can get all of this worldly success, but they don't use it as an opportunity to worship God. They use it as an opportunity to make sure we're successful right here and right now. But then our kids end up leaving our home not really knowing or loving Jesus. They leave our home, their, they leave our home knowing and loving the things of this world and wanting to be successful. But they don't leave our home knowing and loving Jesus, the one through whom their success is supposed to bring glory. Kids even experience this in their schools. The pressure to be popular, the pressure to just fit in, to have this temporary benefit of having friends and being known, being loved, being liked, it's a good, it's a good desire, and yet we're willing. I've even heard it from, from our kids, from, from teenagers all over the place at, at youth group. The pressure to drink or to get involved in vaping or to be sexually active, just to have that temporary benefit, but laying aside our spiritual good and our spiritual inheritance. Hear me say this, I did all of those things in high school. You're not alone in that, teenagers in the room or that would listen later. I know those pressures and those struggles. We would even put 
our worship of God on Sunday morning, rather than it being the central priority, rather than our relationship with God, this, this day of the week that we're to be nourished and strengthened and set aside as a day of rest in God, we simply see worship as a speed bump so that we can get to the thing we really want to do. We can do this so that we can get to the thing that we really long for, whether it's to go play games or play sports or be with friends, rather than fellowshipping with our brothers and sisters in Christ, rather than setting aside the day to worship God. Esau was only focused on the here and now, and we often are too. And yet, the truth was, his inheritance was not of this world. What is the birthright of the gospel? What is the promise that we have from Scripture for what we are to inherit? What are those spiritual inheritances that are promised to us by God? And how do we lay hold of them rather than laying hold of the inheritances of this earth? How do we endure suffering and sacrifice material gain and develop a palate for God? Well, the first thing is that we have to understand our inheritance is not of this world. We have a spiritual and eternal inheritance. If you want to flip over to Romans 8 in your Bibles, Romans 8 chapter, or excuse me, chapter 8 verse 14, Paul writes to the Roman church, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We've been given a spirit of adoption. We've been called sons and daughters of the king, having an internal inheritance. And when we consider the sufferings, as Paul says, I do not consider the sufferings of this present time that are worth comparing to the glory that's to be revealed. If the sufferings of this time, if this thing that we have to give up, this thing that we have to sacrifice, this thing that we have to put less energy into that, so that we can put energy into our relationship with God, if that feels like too much, Paul's saying it's because we don't have a high enough view of God's glory. We don't have a high enough understanding of what we inherit from God. We don't have a high enough desire for God and his goodness, for God and the things that he provides, that we would have a spiritual and eternal benefit from him. Notice he says we are heirs and we will suffer. Following after Christ is a life that is not drab, it is not joyless, Right? It's, filled, it, it's in light of the gospel. We know that Jesus wins. We know that whether, whatever's going on, whether it's a hurricane or the politics that are going on, whatever it is, we know that Jesus wins. And so whatever we go through, we can have joy in what's set before us. And yet it doesn't mean that we're going to live a life without suffering. I think so many of us, we know that we're going to suffer spiritually. Yes, we're going to be persecuted for our faith, for believing certain things. But I think so often we separate that from our physical experience. We think as Christians, why in the world would we still deal with sickness? Why would we still deal with broken relationships and divorce? Why would we deal with a wayward child who doesn't know or love Jesus? Why would we deal with a family member who won't even talk to us because of our decision here or there? And yet it's all wrapped up. God does not lead us astray. He's honest with us. We will experience suffering, and yet we are meant to lay hold of what God has promised to us. Jesus experienced this very same temptation that Esau did. Esau was tired, he was hungry, and he just wanted temporary relief. What is the big deal with sacrificing this thing that he's never really going to experience in this life? It's for the next life. In Matthew 4, after Jesus is baptized, he's led by the Spirit out into the wilderness. Satan comes and he tempts him. The first thing that Satan says to him in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, he says, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of the Almighty, the one who made the entire universe, what are you doing starving yourself? Provide for yourself. It's not a big deal. 
Give this to yourself. It doesn't matter what you're sacrificing. Why would you starve yourself? You have this position. Esau, you are the firstborn son of the one who's been chosen by God. Why would you not demand these things no matter what the cost was? You have been chosen by God. You are part of his people. You have been grafted in and are called a Christian, a child of the Most High. Why would you not lay hold of whatever benefit you could have here? Why would you not name it and claim it right here, right now? Why? Because Jesus says, verse 4, he responds, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, Jesus knew that food was temporary. Bread was temporary. What he needed for eternity was an attachment to his Father. What he needed for eternity was a taste, a palate for God and his glory, and he got that from God's word. He got that from this. Turn, if, you're, if you have your Bibles out, turn to 2 Timothy. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. There's two verses that I would encourage you to commit to memory. The first, it, there's two 316 verses in the scripture that I would encourage you to commit to memory. The first one, most of you probably know. John 316, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 316. 2 Timothy 3.16 is the other one. 2 Timothy 3.16 reads, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is God's very words being laid to paper through prophetic writings. All scripture is God's very words and is profitable for reproof, that's telling us when we're wrong, correction, turning us back to God, and for training in righteousness, showing us the way of righteousness, showing us how we get attached to God, how we live in light of his gospel, how we live so that we can receive his blessing and receive his glory and fall in love with him. That the man or woman, the follower of Christ, the man of God, may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's what we get from this. That's why we preach from this and nothing else. That's why we read this every week. That's why we should read this every day. Because this is our spiritual food. This is the way we fall in love with God. For those who are married, you did not get married to your spouse and then never spend time with them. You did not expect that one day a week of spending time with your spouse would be enough to develop a good and beautiful and loving relationship, and yet we expect that very thing from God. One day a week, just a little bit, just a couple hours a week, and we'll be in love with God, and we'll have a good relationship with God. God calls us to attach ourselves to him, that we would be able to run this race that he's called us to with endurance. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking not to the things of this world, not to our provision, not to our ability, not to the material things, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. How do we run this race with endurance? How do we commit our lives to God? How do we see the things that God has called us to in our work, in our family, in our livelihood, in our business? And how do we use those for God's glory? How do we run this race with endurance so that we can put up with the suffering, put up with the sacrifices, not invest all of our time here? We look to the one who didn't despise his birthright the way Esau did. We look to the older brother who gave up his birthright. Who gave up his birthright so that it could be given to us. Gave up his position, his place at the Father's right hand, so that we could sit in his chair. 
so that we could receive his blessing, so that we could know his father and our father. We run the race with endurance by developing a palate and a taste for God's word. Have you ever used jumper, have, have you ever had to use jumper cables? Most of us probably have, or at least we've been around when they've been used. Jumper cables are simply a wire that you attach from one car that's running to one car that won't so that it can give it enough electricity to start the engine because our battery's dead. That wire carries electric current. And yet there's a limit to how much current that wire can carry. The more current you have, the more current you need to get from point A to point B, the bigger wire you need, the, the thicker wire you need so that it can carry more current. So how would you, if you have those, those jumper cables, what are two things you can do to increase that cable's ability to carry electricity? You could either shorten it or you could make it bigger or make it wider. You could either shorten the distance that the electricity has to travel so that there's less energy lost in that travel or you could widen it so that it can carry more current. The same thing is true in our relationship with God. I've talked about this before, that we are meant, we often attach our lives, we attach our hearts and our souls to the things of this world, but we're meant to attach ourselves and the jumper cables of our hearts to God. And yet when those jumper cables don't give us the energy we need, when we see the sacrifices, when we see how hard this world is and we need more of God, there's two options, there's two opportunities. We either shorten the jumper cables or we make them wider. We increase the frequency, the amount of time, the amount of times during the week or during the day that we go back to God and be reminded of his word and of who he is. Or we widen it so that we get more every time we feast on God's word. Are you developing, are we developing a practice of daily taking in God's word, of daily worship, of daily prayer? Are we putting as much of our input into our relationship with God as we do into social media and our, our desire to put our opinion out there? Or how much we watch the news? Are we putting that much effort into our relationship with our Father? And are we equipping our next generation to do the same? Esau giving up his birthright not only put his own relationship with God at risk, it put the relationship of all of the generations afterward at risk. He was supposed to be the representative through which God would bless the nations and bless the world. Are we thinking about the next generation just as much as Esau should have been? Are we setting a priority for our kids to know and love Jesus, or are we setting a priority for them to know and love something else or someone else? Are we showing our kids, as much as we tell them they should go to Sunday school, they should go to youth group, are we showing them that, that that's our priority too? That we would go to Sunday school, that we would go, be involved in a small group, that we would be involved in a Bible study? Or do we set an example that says, this is important for you, but once you grow up, it's not going to be important anymore? What are we making a priority today? Are we developing a taste for God's word and his spiritual blessings? The only way we develop it, the only way we gain a palate for God is by receiving and taking in on a regular basis this, his word. He gave up his birthright so that we could know his dad. That's the invitation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you would offer your son and that, Lord Jesus, you would not despise your birthright, that you would not lay hold of it, that you would not even turn a stone into bread to serve yourself, but you did everything to serve your people and to obey your Father's will. That you would give up your very position and birthright for us as your children, as your younger brothers and sisters, that we could sit in your seat. Lord, would you develop in us a taste for the godly things. Help us to use, not see the things of this world as evil, but see them as things that you have made that we would use to bring glory and honor and love and worship to you. You've called us all to different things. You've called us all to different works, to different families, to different circumstances. Would we use them all to bring glory to you and would we develop a taste? 
for the glory of God. Would you be with us and strengthen us and transform us today? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand? Let's sing together our final song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. If your faith is in Christ, would you receive this blessing and benediction? Would you draw yourself and would he draw our hearts towards him and would we develop a taste for God and a longing for him above everything else? Receive him and take him at his word. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Would you go in peace? Let's go down the stairs and celebrate.